Well, for our message this morning, we are rolling through the book of Daniel, and we're starting a new part of the series. Chapters 1 through 6 was all about the history and courage of Daniel and his friends. Chapters 7 through 12 is all about freaky dreams and visions. So, question I want to start with everybody today. Show of hands, I want to see you raise your hand. If you have ever had a dream that freaked you out, raise your hand. If you've ever had a dream that freaked you out, yeah, lots of people have had freaky dreams. I've had freaky dreams. Uh, in fact, one thing you may not know about me is that I am a prolific sleepwalker. I really, really am. And uh, I've got a sleepwalker dream that I want to say. Can I tell you my sleepwalk dream? Is that okay? All right. Oh, and before I start, I forgot. I'm joined here by a friend. This is Paul Gable from our communication ministry, who's got a friend in the balcony. And uh, Paul's going to draw for us on the back screen. You'll get an artistic view of what I'm preaching today. Can you guys welcome Paul? Yeah. All right. So uh, 1994 is the year of my freaky sleepwalking dream, or one of many, actually. And uh, for those of you who remember 1994, two deep, profound, important things happened in 1994 that got the world talking. One of those things was... O.J. Simpson changed from running back to criminal. And he was running from the police in the white Bronco, and there was a big trial that came out that, that year. Uh, old people, do you remember O.J. Simpson? Yeah, okay, just checking, just to make sure. And uh, so that was always in the news. The other powerful thing that happened that year is my oldest son was born. Yeah, it was a beautiful thing. And uh, so in exhaustion, Kelly and I one night were, you know, watching TV, seeing the OJ news come to play, and uh, we happened to fall asleep in the living room that night on different couches. And uh, in the middle of the night, it's oftentimes my, my, my luck, my lot in life, that I will wake up in the middle of the night in a different room of the house looking out the window and not know how I got there. And uh, so on this night, we both fell asleep on the couch. I got up from the couch, walked over to my sleeping young bride, holding our beautiful newborn child, and said a question that no husband should ever say to his wife. So, who's the father? <laughs> I know. In my mind, I was thinking maybe it was OJ. <laughs> but trust me, my baby looks nothing like OJ and a lot like me. And so uh, it was a really bad mistake. I woke up that night to the angry eyes of my wife. <laughs> All right. Well, Daniel had freaky dreams too. I had freaky dreams. And sometimes we're disturbed by our dreams. Sometimes Daniel was disturbed by his dream. Check out what he says in chapter 7, verse 15, after describing a dream. He says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. So if you're a little bit freaked out because you've been reading in advance and you're like, I have no idea what this stuff means, well, join the Daniel Club because he was disturbed by these things as well. Now, in the next four weeks, we're going to be exploring the dreams of Daniel. This genre of literature is called apocalyptic literature. Now, when we use the term apocalyptic, oftentimes we think of end-of-the-earth destruction in our culture, and that's a good definition, but in the Greek, the word apocalyp apocalypsis actually doesn't mean end-of-the-world destruction, it means to uncover or to reveal. So these dreams that Daniel is having is dreams of things that are happening in the heavenly realms, and they're designed to uncover the spiritual world. Uh, uncover the world of angels, uncover the future that's being predicted by Daniel. It's a revealing, it's apocalyptic literature. Now you need to know that Daniel's dreams are all about what's going to happen in his future. But for many of these dreams, what was in Daniel's future is now in our past. And so we can look back on these dreams and find out, you know, did they actually happen the way that Daniel said they would? Some of the, them get fulfilled in world history, some of them get fulfilled in the life of Jesus, and some of them still have yet to be fulfilled today. Now, what's even deeper in Daniel's dreams is that some of his dreams have a double fulfillment, so he'll be looking towards the future, and they'll get fulfilled in world history or in Jesus, but we're still waiting for them to be fulfilled sometime in the future as well. Are you guys tracking with me so far? So this is what we're going to be taking a look at as we're looking at Daniel's dreams. When we do, Daniel's dreams put us in contact 
with a realm, a spiritual realm that is very real. He gets two angel visitations. He dreams a a few dreams. And it reminds us that this physical reality that we live in is just the tip of the iceberg. And beneath that is a massive spiritual war that's happening for the hearts and minds of people. There's battles and dreams and time-suspending scenarios that interact with our current reality. But every so often, they're revealed in an apocalyptic dream or vision. So, if you want to dig into Daniel's dreams, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. If you're here in the room and you've got a Bible under your seat, it's page 619, and we're going to dive right in. One final thought. Diving into apocalyptic literature should result in hope. If, for whatever reason, this apocalyptic literature doesn't land in hope, if it creates anxiety, worry, depression, sleepless nights, or ulcers, then I'm teaching it wrong. And if you walk out of this sermon more scared than when you came in, I apologize in advance for my bad preaching. All right, here we go. Daniel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Here's what it says. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Now let's pause right here for a minute, because there's a time marker in this passage. It says, in the first year of of King Belshazzar. Those of you who have been following our series would realize that we ended Daniel chapter 6, past the Babylonian Empire, past Belshazzar, into the Persian Empire, and that this is actually taking us backwards in time. So it's taking us back to somewhere around 556 or 555 BC, when Babylon was still in power, Belshazzar was still king, it was his first year in power. So remember that as we go through. Verse 2, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. Then before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth in between its teeth, and it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird, and this beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. All right, so this vision is going to have four beasts. That was beast number one, beast number two, and beast number three. And whenever you think of beasts in apocalyptic visions in the Bible, I want you to think of evil empire. Somebody say evil empire. I want you to think of an evil empire. Beasts are a personification of evil. You remember this all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were there, minding their own business, hanging out with God, when all of a sudden somebody came in to tempt them, and the tempter was a serpent, a kind of a beast that came into their lives to get them to not act like God designed them to act, but to act like beasts. And this beastliness got transferred into the next generation when Cain took it to a new level by killing his brother Abel. And those of you who remember our Genesis series in the spring, remember this downward spiral of beastliness that kept on pervading people who were acting more like animals than like the rulers they were created to be. And eventually this had its culmination in all the people getting together and saying, let's build a city where we can reach God and be like God. And they built this massive ziggurat that was called the Tower of Babel. And that city called Babel eventually became the city named Babylon. And that's where Daniel is right here at the time. And so this thread of evil being beastly is just a part of the thread of biblical history. But when that evil becomes systemic and powerful and mighty like an empire... Okay, now it's a big, powerful beast. 
So Daniel has a vision of four beasts in a row. Beast number one is one that was like a lion. Now, these four beasts follow a parallel of a vision that you'll remember from Jed's sermon uh, that he gave Nebuchadnezzar's vision, Daniel chapter 2. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you'll remember that that vision was about a statue that had four parts to it, and each of the four parts was an empire, and then a rock that was going to crash into the last empire and turn into a mountain. Well, this vision that Daniel's having is a parallel vision. It's a vision about the same thing. It's about empires that are yet to come. And so there's a a parallel between the first beast, the lion with wings, and the head of gold, which represented Babylon. Now, this becomes obvious when you think about it. You've got this lion with wings, a beastly figure, wings are plucked off, and then it becomes like a human being and is given a mind of a human. As you've been reading the book of Daniel, this should trigger in your mind, oh, that's Daniel chapter 4, when Nebuchadnezzar walked on all fours for seven years like a beast, and then he was reclaimed, made back into his human humanity, and given the mind of a human. So the lion is a very obvious allusion, not just to Babylon, but to Nebuchadnezzar himself, who is at the peak of the Babylonian empire. All right. If you go to the second beast, the second beast is a bear. And the bear represents the next empire that came into play. It was the Medo-Persian Empire. I've usually called it the Persian Empire up to this point, but if you're more accurate, it's actually the Medo-Persian Empire that had two people groups that came together to co-rule, but one was bigger than the other one, and so you've got the bear who's kind of on one side. One side is stronger than the other one. In his mouth are these three little bones, these three ribs, And uh, as I've consulted with uh, scholars and what scholars have written this week, there's not a universal agreement on what those bones mean. Some say it's three key battles that were won. Some say it was three key empires that were conquered. Some say it was three key directions that they expanded, north and east, east and west. I don't actually know what those mean, but the bear is the Persian Empire. And you'll notice that it's not necessarily a bear. Each time he says it's what like a lion. It was like a bear. It was like a leopard. The idea is that these beasts aren't exactly like what God created, but they're kind of mutant forms that take on some strange characteristics. It's not exactly the same. It's a little bit different. So that's the Medo-Persian Empire. And then you've got hundreds of years, probably 300 years into 200 years into the future for Daniel is the next empire that comes to bear. It's a leopard. Now, quick quiz question. Would a leopard be an animal that represents things that are slow or things that are fast? Fast. And what about a leopard with wings? What would that represent? Like super fast. So you've got the super fast empire that's coming. Well, what is it that makes an empire super fast. Well, if you remember, the Greek empire was led by Alexander the Great, and he conquered huge amounts of territory, beginning with Greece and then going all the way down into Egypt through the entirety of the Middle East and then winding up in India. He conquered all of that territory in, get this, 11 years without any modern transportation And he finished his conquering at the age of 32. So from age 21 to 32, he conquered the known world. That's a super fast growth of an empire. Well, what about the four heads? I mean, that's kind of a weird thing in that vision. Well, when Alexander the Great died, he didn't leave leave his kingdom to an heir. He left his kingdom to his four generals. And that kingdom got split into four pieces, each with a different general that was leading the empire. So that's the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire. Okay, how you guys doing? Are we all right so far? Okay, if you're tracking with me, say I'm tracking. Okay, we're going to keep on rolling then. Fourth beast, verse 7. After that, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts. It had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like a human being and a mouth that spoke 
boastfully. All right, enter beast number four. You'll notice that he doesn't even say beast number four is like any kind of animal that we could compare it to. It's like the mutant of mutants. And all he has to describe it is its horrible claws and flashing teeth and the way that destruction was at, in its wake. The ten horns that are on the beast stand for ten kings that will be a part of this kingdom. And ten is a symbolic number. It just it means there's going to be a long reign with tons of kings that are going to be out there. This represents the Roman Empire, the next one to take over. The Roman Empire was just filled with awe and destruction and wrath that came in its wake. You'll notice that in the uh, Nebuchadnezzar vision, Rome was down at the bottom uh, with, the, with the legs that were down there. Well, that final beast represents the Roman uh, Empire in parallel with the legs. Now, a couple of things to think about is that this fulfillment of the last beast and the final, uh, the final passage comes back in the book of Revelation. Those of you who are Bible students will remember to Revelation chapter 13, there's also a beast with 10 horns in Revelation chapter 13, which makes us ask, okay, so what is the fulfillment of all of this? Because as John is talking about Revelation 13, he's talking about two things. One, he's talking about his present, what's going on, and John would be very, very savvy when it comes to Daniel's literature. He would know that a beast with 10 horns is a fulfillment of what John had predicted. I mean, Daniel had predicted. And he would know that they were in that period of the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, because when John wrote in the end of the first century, John was in the middle of the Roman Empire and connected to biblical prophecy. So he knows these two things are connected. But John is also talking about a future time that's going to come later on after his lifetime is over when there will be the appearance of this beast that will once and for all set itself up against the holy people of God. So from Daniel's perspective, the fourth beast is a double fulfillment. It's going to be fulfilled in Rome and then John lets us know it's going to be fulfilled again sometime in the future. This fourth beast is coming back. And for those of you who love to do a little homework, to double check my work when you get home, you can go back and look at Revelation chapter 13 and you'll find all four beasts from Daniel chapter 7 combined into one mega beast uh, that is going to be the PR agent for the dragon in the uh, story of Revelation. Now, one of the most significant pieces of this final beast is the little horn. It's a tiny little horn, and it comes up, and it starts bragging boastfully, and like the other three empires, oppressing the people of God. Now, this little horn, this boastful one that comes at the end of time, has multiple allusions to it in the New Testament as well. And what Daniel nicknames as the little horn, we have a different nickname for right now. Our nickname for that little horn is the Antichrist. The Antichrist who comes in and sets himself up against God and brags and oppresses God's people. That's, that's the Antichrist. And sometimes when we think of the Antichrist, I think we think of somebody who's got like, you know, in the movies, the Antichrist with pointy teeth and a growly voice and chronic halitosis. But I think in reality, the Antichrist is going to be a very charismatic, powerful figure that emerges on the scene. I think it'll be a, 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 an attractive political leader that comes to play. And he's far more likely to have a very nice suit and well-coiffed hair and great teeth and an articulate, persuasive voice because he's going to get an awful lot of people that will wind up following him. Now, people have speculated throughout the years who this Antichrist might be among political figures. I remember when I was in high school, there was speculation that the Antichrist was Ronald Reagan. After all, you know, Ronald, Wilson, Reagan, six letters in Ronald, six in Wilson, six in Reagan, you know. Uh, today, people will much more likely talk about Vladimir Putin or Volodymyr Zelensky or Bill Gates, George Soros, yea, even Donald Trump has been speculated upon. And friends, I just say, I don't think it's helpful to speculate on this. Uh, there's way too much that's mysterious and symbolic to figure it out in advance, but when it happens, it's going to be clear for us. 
it's gonna be clear for us. So we don't know the who, but we do know that this Antichrist is gonna be the mouthpiece for the beast. More on that in a minute, because at this point, the vision shifts. So let's look at the vision shift in verse nine. It's a courtroom scene. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. All right, enter a brand new character. We got four beasts, and then all of a sudden, somebody shows up whose hair is white as snow, his clothes is perfect and radiant. There's this amazing power that comes from him. Fire is blazing. A river of fire is coming out from his throne, and his name is the Ancient of Days. Like, he has been around forever. Who are we talking about here? This is God. This is God right here in the midst of the courtroom scene and millions of people, people of every tongue and tribe and language and color and ethnicity are all at the throne worshiping God together. And it says the court was seated and judgment was about to happen. Books were opened up, presumably books about the deeds of the multitudes who were before him who were about to be judged the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes from their lives. And this scene, in my humble opinion, is one of the very coolest scenes that we see in the entirety of the Old Testament about what's going to happen in the future. And I'm convinced that this is not just a dream sequence, but this is a picture of something that's really going to happen in our future. Let's let the story keep on unfolding. Verse 11. Then I continued to watch. Because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. Okay, so in the courtroom, you now have the Ancient of Days and all the people worshiping him, and you realize that the beast himself is in the courtroom too. And that little horn is there, and that pesky little horn, he just keeps on talking. Now remember, the horn is just one part of the larger fourth beast that's symbolic of a great world power that drags people away from God. And that beast is slain, and he's thrown into a blazing fire. Now those of you who are Bible students, do you recall another place in the Bible where a beast is slain and thrown into a blazing fire? Yeah, it's Revelation chapter 20, if you're interested in taking a look at it later. Now, one of the things that you should be noticing right here is that some of the stuff we read in Daniel has a revisit in the book of Revelation. And you're going to find that over and over and over again. Uh, Some people will say that John's mind, John who wrote Revelation, his mind is so steeped in Old Testament literature, including Daniel, that he can't help but include some of those pictures in his own visions. And I think that's partially true, but I think what's even bigger than that is that what's revealed to Daniel and what's revealed to John are the same scene and God's showing it to two of his different servants because this scene is going to be real and each of them are going to remember different details than the other one. You guys tracking with me on this one? So we're talking about the same scene where the beast is slain and thrown into a blazing fire. Daniel sees it first, John confirms it. Now, the good news about this is that as bad as the beast is, and the beast really, really is bad, the beast is also doomed. And this should give us hope, because the beast being doomed is good news. Amen? Verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. (laughs) A son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. 
And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So in comes the hero of the story, the son of man, the one who's brought before the Lord and given glory and honor and power and sovereignty, and everybody bows down and worships him. And he's got a kingdom that's going to last forever and ever. Now, if we go back to the statue vision that we had in chapter two, we see that the kingdom of God crashing in, crashes in on the Roman Empire, and it establishes a brand new mountain that is never going to fade. The vision of Daniel in the courtroom scene of this eternal kingdom is similar to the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had with the uh, rock that becomes a great mountain. There's something that is going to be perfected and forever. Note the rock at the base of the statue reminds us of the main idea of the book of Daniel, and that is this, that an eternal kingdom is coming. This world is not all there is. Justice will be done, and hope is available, not just for the Jewish people, but hope is available for everyone. And it all wraps around this character who's introduced at this point as the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Ooh, I heard whispers all throughout the room. They were right, they were right. Jesus, Jesus is the Son of Man. Have you ever noticed that when Jesus comes onto the scene, if you ask other people who Jesus is, they'll point to him and say he is the Messiah. That's the Hebrew word for the anointed one or the coming one, or he's the Christ, Greek word, meaning the same thing. He's the Messiah or the Christ. But when Jesus talks about himself, he almost never uses those terms, Messiah or Christ. Instead, the nickname that Jesus likes best for himself is the nickname Son of Man. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, in the book of Ezekiel, we see Ezekiel being called Son of Man 93 times. When God talks to him, he says, Son of Man, say to the people this, or Son of Man, go, Son of man, go to this place. Ezekiel considers himself to be the Son of Man, and it's a reminder of his humanity. On the other side, you've got this dramatic picture in Daniel that would be seared into the minds of every Jewish person as they think about the future, where there's a son of man who's going to be worshipped by everybody, who's going to have glory and dominion and honor and power and a kingdom that will never pass away. It is a symbol of God. So if Jesus wanted to communicate in a compact phrase, I am fully human and I am fully God, introducing a brand new doctrine that never been, and nobody has ever heard about before, he could simply use the short three-word phrase, son of man. I'm the son of man. That's why Jesus talked about himself. He used the phrase son of man. Now, he oftentimes used this phrase son of man at the points where he is face-to-face with people who are monotheistic, who are believers in God, and he's claiming before them that he is, in fact, God. Here's a few examples. Matthew chapter 12, verse 8 says, For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Who can claim to be the Lord of the Sabbath? Well, only God. He's to be worshipped on the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, for the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Only God can claim to forgive somebody's sins generically. Matthew 13, 41, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom of everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Who sends out angels? That's God's job. In essence, Jesus is saying over and over when he uses the phrase Son of Man, I am God, I am God, I am God. Now, this would be really clear to Jesus' audience of the day. For us, removed by thousands of years and thousands of miles, we kind of have to have it explained to us. But it would be a lot like in Jesus' day, it would be a lot like a Star Wars convention. And somebody walks into the Star Wars convention wearing a black robe and a black cape and a black helmet, carrying a red lightsaber and walking around saying to people, I am your father. Right? And if you see that happening at a Star Wars convention, who are we talking about? 
Darth Vader. He doesn't have to say, hey, everybody, I'm Darth Vader. He just acts that way, and people know who you're talking about. Well, in Jesus' day, it was the same thing with the Son of Man. You say you're the Son of Man, it's obvious to everyone around you. And perhaps the scene that I love the most where Jesus uses this phrase is when Jesus was on trial. He's at the end of his life, and uh, all of uh, his, his disciples have abandoned him. He's been brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders who understand all of this imagery and symbolism, and they want to know, are you really a blasphemer? Do you really claim to be God? And here's how the scene unfolds. 2663 says this. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You've said so, Jesus replies. I love how he throws it right back at him there. You've said so, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Daniel 7 on steroids right there. Then the high priest tore his clothes and he says, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. You see, these guys who knew the Old Testament knew that to claim to be the Son of Man is to claim to be God. To claim to say, I will one day judge you. I will rule forever. And the high priest identified that as easily as identifying Darth Vader at a Star Wars convention. Blasphemy. He's claiming to be God. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. You think? I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and he gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. You know, this is the summary of the whole vision. Four basic things. The four kingdoms are going to come and go, but in the end, the kingdom of God will last forever. Next verse. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others, that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And after them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, And he will subdue the three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So here, the being, I think an angel, is communicating with Daniel and clarifying this vision. There's a fourth kingdom that's got a double fulfillment. It's all about Rome. And Rome literally oppressed the Jewish people uh, for centuries and was around for about a thousand years. They're the ones who were in charge when Jesus was killed. They're the ones who were in charge when they destroyed the temple in AD 70. But it also represents a future kingdom beyond Rome. It might be our future. It might happen in our lifetimes. But friends, You do not need to be afraid of this. You should be prepared, but it shouldn't create anxiety or doubt or pain for you because you know that its time is limited and our time on this earth is limited. You know that Jesus will rule. You know that God is still on the throne and that you are his. You know that the people of God will reign while the beast is destroyed. And this is good news, amen? 
Verse 26. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled in my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So back to the courtroom scene. Three key facts that I want to remind you of that you should be paying attention to in this text. Fact number one is that evil will be destroyed once and for all. There's going to come a day when there will be no more child abuse and no more wars, no more adultery, no more torture, no more injustice, no more anxiety, no more divorce, no more racism. All of these things will be destroyed. And the power of the beast will be taken away, and we will be set free from evil. (laughs) Fact number two is this. The sovereignty, power, and greatness of all of the kings under heaven will be handed over. And who will they be handed over to? The holy people of God. Did Did you see that? The kingdoms will be handed over to the holy people of God. Do you know who that is? That's you. That's me. There's going to come a day when we will be co-rulers with God over all of the kingdoms that he has established. Friends, if your view of heaven is a cloud float or an eternal golf game or a long choir sing, you are shooting way too low. The future of heaven is co-ruling with God over kingdoms for all eternity. That is God's promise. And then the third fact is that this kingdom lasts forever. That's what we're going to be doing forever and ever. Amen. Just like the rock that became a mountain is a sign of permanence, so is the kingdom of God permanent. Now, Revelation helps to round out some of this final courtroom scene. If you go into the book of Revelation, it talks about all those books that were opened that day in front of all of the multitudes, and we ask, what was in, that, in those books? Well, I think the most likely story for all of those books is it was written down the deeds of the people in the multitudes who are being judged, hundreds of millions of people, page after page, of a person's life and the things that they did while they were in the body. And at the end of every person's record, at the end of every page, is going to be a grade, and the grade will say, fail. Fail, 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 fail all through humanity. Because the truth about me and the truth about all of us is that we are a mixed bag of good and evil deeds. Sure, we do some good things in our life, but we do an awful lot of bad things. We do things with mixed motives. We think thoughts that we would never want people to know what our thought life is like. We tell lies, we hurt people, we manipulate, we destroy all throughout our lifetime, friends. We are filled with evil, and we don't deserve to be in God's presence, and we certainly don't deserve to be co-ruling kingdoms alongside God. And when I said that, some of you thought, that's ridiculous to think of me in that position, and truth is, it is. But there's one book that's going to be opened on that day, one book that the Son of Man is going to bring in order to be able to read. In Revelation, it's called the Book of Life, or the Lamb's Book of Life. And in that book is the list of people who have trusted in Jesus. It's the list of Jesus' friends. So when somebody walks into the scene and they're found out that they come before God and they are declared guilty, Jesus steps in and he says, oh, no, 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 that's Mark. He's my friend. He gets to come in. Because I already paid for his guilt, and now I'm going to declare him innocent. And there's going to be a long list of people who get in, not because they're so good, but because Jesus is so good. And he says, transfer their guilt to me, and I'll let them in, because they're my family. They're my friends. They're the ones that I've died for. They're the ones who trusted in me. 
And the cool thing is he leaves it open to anybody who wants to, to get into the Lamb's book of life. All you have to do is trust in Jesus. All you have to do is say, I can't get there on my own, but I'm trusting in Jesus to do that work for me. Oh man, friends, if that's the case for you, you are guaranteed a ticket to be a co-ruler with God forever and ever, amen. Now the cost of that is that you say, I have to humble myself before God. I have to trust him and say that God is God and I'm not and I'm gonna get on the God plan and not on my plan anymore and live my life for him forever and ever. But man, when I think about the costs and benefits of that situation, I'm just like, this is a really easy decision and everybody's invited. And today I'm not gonna do any kind of a big emotional appeal to this. I'm just laying out the facts and laying out your future and I wanna give you the chance to say yes to God if you want to today, if you wanna trust in him. For everybody, we should be thinking about how am I going to live in light of the fact that there is an eternity that's coming, that God's in charge of history and there's gonna be judgment and this is the stuff that's gonna matter in the end. But if you're somebody who hasn't done your business with God yet and you're saying, oh, I I need to get things right with God for my own personal self, then you can do that in a moment. It, It can be encapsulated in a moment of prayer where you say yes to Jesus and at that moment you turn from being a rebel to being a follower of Jesus, allowing him to cancel your debt and forgive your sins. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray right now. And if you're somebody who would love to join me in that prayer, I would invite you to join me for the first time. But I'm gonna ask everybody in the room and everybody online to bow your heads right now and uh, pray along with me. Let's pray. God, I just wanna say thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in so many ways in the Bible, in Jesus, and in weird dreams that come into to Daniel's mind. And thanks for what you've taught us today about not only the events of world history, but also about the events that have the culmination in Jesus and at the end of time. And I pray for us, God, that we would live with that eternity in mind. I pray that we would live with the future in mind. We pray, God, that we would live with hearts that are tuned into your hearts. And as we understand these passages of scripture more, it would cause us to live lives that are pleasing to you. And today, God, I especially want to pray for people who are ready to say yes to you for the very first time, who want to say, okay, I'm ready to believe in God. I want to buy into the Jesus plan and have a future of ruling with him forever and ever. And so, God, I pray for these friends. I pray that you'll give them the courage to say, I'm not trusting in myself anymore. I'm trusting in Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Son of Man. I believe that Jesus' death was good enough to pay for my wrongdoing. And I'm ready to have my name written in that Lamb's Book of Life to be there forever and ever and ever. I trust in you, Jesus. We're grateful for your power and your presence. And we pray these things in your mighty name, the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Hey, let's give it up for Jesus, who's going to be the Son of Man, for the Father, who's the Ancient of Days, and this amazing scene that we get to be a part of. God's blessings to all of you. We'll see you later. Thanks again for engaging with us from wherever in the world you are. Our hope is that this ministered to you. And we love to hear stories about how this ministry is impacting your life. If you have a story, please hit the connect button at cccomaha.info. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. See you again soon.